Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Jill Robbins and Andrew Smith have a report on rising rates of obesity among members of the U.S. military. Brian Lynn presents this week's science report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here are Jill and Andrew. Early COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns. Long hours on his computer and increased stress led U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Daniel Murillo to eat more. Then, places to work out were closed, organized exercise was out, and Murillo's desire to work out on his own was low. The uniform was tighter," said Murillo after gaining over 13 kilograms during the pandemic. "I could notice it," he added. Murillo was not the only U.S. soldier to deal with extra weight. New research says that the extra weight problem greatly increased in the U.S. military. During the pandemic, in the army alone, almost ten thousand soldiers became heavily overweight or obese between February 2019 and June 2021. That is nearly 25 percent of the soldiers in the study. The Navy and the Marines also showed weight gains. The Army and the other services need to focus on how to bring the forces back to fitness," said Tracy Perez Colmus, who led the research. She is the director of the Center for Health Services Research at. The Uniformed Services University in Bethesda, Maryland. Overweight and obese troops are more likely to be injured, and less likely to continue their physical work long term. Government research shows that the military loses more than six hundred fifty thousand workdays yearly because of extra weight. And obesity-related health costs are more than 1.5 billion dollars each year for current and former soldiers and their families. Military leaders have been warning about the impact of obesity on the U.S. military for more than 10 years. The pandemic effects show the need for urgent action," said retired Marine Corps Brigadier General Stephen Cheney. Who co-wrote a recent report on the problem? The numbers have not gotten better, Cheney said in a November online conference held by the American Security Project, a nonprofit organization. They are just getting worse and worse and worse. Last year, the U.S. Army did not meet its goal of signing up new soldiers for the first time. Being overweight disqualifies more than ten percent of people, ages seventeen to twenty-four, who could enter the military. Cheney said it is devastating, and he called it a national security problem. Extra weight can make it difficult for soldiers to meet the military fitness requirements. In the army. If soldiers cannot pass the Army Combat Fitness Test, it could end their military careers. 
The researchers looked at nearly 200,000 soldiers from two periods. Before the pandemic, from February 2019 to January 2020, and during the crisis, from September 2020 to June 2021. They found that nearly 27% who were healthy before the pandemic became overweight. And nearly 16% of those who were previously overweight became obese. About 18% of the soldiers were obese before the pandemic. By 2021, it grew to 23%. The researchers used a calculation of weight and height called BMI, or Body Mass Index. A person with a BMI of 18.5 to 25 is considered healthy while a BMI of 25 to less than 30 is considered overweight. A BMI of 30 or higher is considered obese. Some experts say the BMI measure is flawed. They say it does not consider muscle mass or other health conditions in its calculations. However, BMI remains a widely used tool. In Sergeant Murillo's case, his BMI during the pandemic reached nearly 32. He knew he needed help, so he started a strict exercise program through the Army's Holistic Health and Fitness or H2F, program. We do two runs a week, six and a half to eight kilometers, Murillo said. Some mornings I wanted to quit, but I hung in there. Now his BMI is just over 27, which is within the Defense Department's standard. Putting on extra weight during the pandemic was not just a military problem. A study last year of American adults found that nearly half reported gaining weight after the first year of the COVID-19 emergency. Another study found a sharp rise in obesity among children. The gains came in a country where more than 40% of adults and nearly 20% of children are obese, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said. I'm Andrew Smith. And I'm Jill Robbins. The American Space Agency, NASA, has chosen the astronaut crew that will carry out a planned test mission around the moon next year. The trip is part of NASA's Artemis program, which aims to land the next Americans on the moon. Four astronauts will take part in the flight, which NASA is officially calling Artemis II. Artemis II planned for late 2024, will send the astronauts on NASA's Orion spacecraft on a 10-day trip around the moon. The aim of the mission is to test all Orion's systems with human astronauts in place. Last December, Orion completed another test flight with no astronauts on board. During that test mission, called Artemis One, 
the spacecraft traveled more than 2.2 million kilometers around the moon and back. After the flight, NASA reported the Orion spacecraft had performed above the agency's expectations. If Artemis II is successful, a third mission, Artemis III, will be launched, aiming to land astronauts on the surface of the moon. That effort, which NASA has said will include the first woman and person of color, is expected to take place in the coming years. It would be the first moon landing by astronauts since NASA's Apollo 17 mission in 1972. In announcing its choices for Artemis II, NASA named the first woman and first African American to be included on a lunar mission. One of the astronauts is Christina Koch, who will serve as Mission Specialist One. She is a 44-year-old engineer who holds the record for the longest continuous space flight by a woman. She also took part in NASA's first three all-female spacewalks. Koch will be joined by Victor Glover. He is a 46-year-old U.S. Navy pilot who has carried out four spacewalks. Glover, who will serve as the mission's pilot, will be the first black astronaut ever chosen for a moon mission. Also, part of the crew will be 47-year-old Jeremy Hansen, a colonel in the Royal Canadian Air Force, who will serve as mission specialist too. Former U.S. Navy fighter pilot Reed Wiseman, also 47, will serve on Artemis II as the mission commander. The Artemis II crew represents thousands of people working tirelessly to bring us to the stars. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson said in announcing the choices, This is humanity's crew, he added. Koch said to cheers from the crowd, Am I excited? Absolutely. But my real question is, are you excited? She added. The Canadian Space Agency got a seat on the flight because of its work with NASA on developing robotic arms and space station equipment. Hansen said he is thankful Canada is going to be part of the mission. We are going to the moon together. Let's go, he said. Artemis II is expected to reach a point more than 370,000 kilometers away from Earth. The traditional low Earth orbit of the International Space Station is about 400 kilometers above Earth's surface. I'm Brian Lynn. Brian Lynn joins me now to talk more about his science report. Thanks for being here, Brian. Sure, Ashley. Glad to be here. In this week's report, you introduced the new astronauts chosen by NASA to take part in the Space Agency's next moon mission. I know these astronauts won't be flying anytime soon, and they will not be stepping onto the surface of the moon. But what does NASA hope to learn from the mission? So it will be part of the Artemis program, which aims to put Americans back on the moon for the first time since 1972. Artemis already had one test flight, which involved NASA's Orion spacecraft flying by itself around the moon, that ended in uh, December. The new astronauts will be flying on Orion on a similar trip. NASA says the goal of the next mission will be to test all Orion's systems with human astronauts in the spacecraft. 
And my understanding is that another future mission would actually land American astronauts again on the moon. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. And the timeline for these upcoming missions is currently not very firm. Um, right now, NASA is saying the newly chosen astronauts for Artemis II should launch by late 2024. Then, if all goes well with that mission, Artemis III would be planned. And that is the flight that would aim to land on the surface of the moon. The space agency is not giving a specific date for when that might happen. But in the past, officials have suggested Artemis III could launch sometime in the mid-2020s. Okay. Well, thanks again, Brian, for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Barbara Klein. And I'm Steve Ember. The stock market crash of 1929 marked the beginning of the worst economic crisis in American history. Millions of people lost their jobs. Thousands lost their homes. During the next several years, a large part of the richest nation on earth learned what it meant to be poor. Workers lost their jobs as factories closed. Business owners lost their stores and sometimes their homes. Farmers lost their land as they struggled with falling prices and natural disasters. And Americans were not the only ones who suffered. One of America's greatest writers, John Steinbeck, described the Depression this way. It was a terrible, troubled time. I can't think of any ten years in history when so much happened in so many directions. Violent change took place. Our country was shaped. Our lives changed. Our government rebuilt. Steinbeck, winner of the 1962 Nobel Prize in Literature, said, When the market fell, the factories, mines, and steelworks closed, and then no one could buy anything, not even food. Unemployed auto worker in Detroit, Michigan, described the situation this way. Before daylight, we were on the way to the Chevrolet factory to look for work. The police were already there, waving us away from the office. They were saying, nothing doing, no jobs, no jobs. So now we were walking slowly through the falling snow to the employment office for the Dodge Auto Company. A big, well-fed man in a heavy overcoat stood at the door. No, no, he said. There was no work. One Texas farmer lost his farm and moved his family to California to look for work. We can't send the children to school, he said, because they have no clothes. The economic crisis began with the stock market crash in October 1929. For the first year, the economy fell very slowly, but it dropped sharply in 1931 and 1932. And by the end of 1932, the economy collapsed almost completely. During the three years following the stock market crash, the value of goods and services produced in America fell by almost half. The wealth of the average American dropped to a level lower than it had been 25 years earlier. All the gains of the 1920s were washed away. Unemployment rose sharply. The number of workers looking for a job jumped from 3% to more than 25% in just four years. One of every three or four workers 
was looking for a job in 1932. Those employment numbers did not include farmers. The men and women who grew the nation's food suffered terribly during the Great Depression. This was especially true in two states, Oklahoma and Texas. Farmers there were losing money because of falling prices for their crops. Then natural disasters struck. Year after year, little or no rain fell. The ground dried up, and then the wind blew away the earth in huge clouds of dust. All that dust made some of the farmers leave, one Oklahoma farmer remembered later. But my family stayed. We fought to live. Despite all the dust and the wind, we were planting seeds. But we got no crops. We had five crop failures in five years. Falling production, rising unemployment, men begging in the streets. But there was more to the Great Depression. At that time, the federal government did not guarantee the money that people put in banks. When people could not repay loans, banks began to close. In 1929, 659 banks with total holdings of $200 million went out of business. The next year, two times that number failed. And the year after that, almost twice that number of banks went out of business. Millions of people lost all their savings. They had no money left. The Depression caused serious public health problems. Hospitals across the country were filled with sick people whose main illness was a lack of food. The health department in New York City found that one of every five of the city's children did not get enough food. 99% of the children attending a school in a coal mining area of the country reportedly were underweight. In some places, people died of hunger. The quality of housing also fell. Families were forced to crowd into small houses or apartments to share costs. Many people had no homes at all. They slept on public streets, buses, or trains. One official in Chicago reported in 1931 that several hundred women without homes were sleeping in city parks. In a number of cities, people without homes built their houses from whatever materials they could find. They used empty boxes or pieces of metal to build shelters in open areas. People called these areas of little temporary houses Hoovervilles. They blamed President Hoover for their situation. So too did the men forced to sleep in public parks at night. They covered themselves with pieces of paper and they called the paper Hoover Blankets. People without money in their pants called their empty pockets Hoover Flags. People blamed President Hoover because they thought he was not doing enough to help them. Hoover did take several actions to try to improve the economy. But he resisted proposals for the federal government to provide aid in a major way. And he refused to let the government spend more money than it earned. Hoover told the nation, Economic depression cannot be cured by legislative action or executive decision. Many conservative Americans agreed with him but not the millions of Americans who were hungry and tired of looking for a job. 
They accused Hoover of not caring about common citizens. One congressman from Alabama said, In the White House, we have a man more interested in the money of the rich than in the stomachs of the poor. On and on, the Great Depression continued. Of course, some Americans were lucky. They kept their jobs. And they had enough money to enjoy the lower prices of most goods. Many people shared their earnings with friends in need. Years later, John Steinbeck wrote, It seems odd now to say that we rarely had a job. There just weren't any jobs. But he continued, Given the sea and the gardens, we did pretty well with a minimum of theft. We didn't have to steal much. Farmers could not sell their crops, he explained, so they gave away all the fruit and vegetables that people could carry home. Other Americans reacted to the crisis by leading protests against the economic policies of the Hoover administration. In 1932, a large group of former soldiers gathered in Washington to demand help. More than 8,000 of them built the nation's largest Hooverville near the White House. Federal troops finally removed them by force and burned their shelters. Next week, we will look at how the Great Depression of the 1930s affected other countries. Went slogging through hell, and I was the kid with a drum. <laughs>